Good morning. Good morning. We will be discussing December 2020 online examination SL2. Actually, it was a exam uh, first time done in history, I think, in online form. So, there had been uh, more time allocated for the people to attempt the exam. So, we will discuss question 1 first. Shall we look at the A part of the question? The organizations pursue different objectives and profit max maximization and wealth maximization are two of them. Differentiate the concepts of profit maximization and wealth maximization. So, I am sure like it is the uh, framework or the maybe the initial uh, discussion of financial management wherever we have studied it would have been discussed because the primary objectives primary objective if you take of any company primary objective generally uh, the perception is that primary objective is to making profits truly speaking it is not primary objective is to wealth maximization of the shareholders not anybody else the shareholders we are predominantly discuss the private sector organizations private sector organizations primary objective is to uh, create wealth or wealth maximization it's not the profit target we'll discuss that the difference so the shareholders are the key who are the one who take the risk and invest their monies so the objective or the primary objective of any organization you take any industry it can be hospital it can be hotel it can be banks it can be uh, manufacturing organization service organization any type any type of private sector organizations they are they are uh, working towards achieving this object it looks sometimes that people are interested about various other things but if you look at on a long run the underlying thing which works in the organization is the wealth maximization why it happens like that the shareholders who is the one who put the money in the company and he would like to see that his wealth his shares value increase over time period so that's his purpose it's the purpose of the organization it's not just selling more sales units or producing more units or getting more customers true that all are part of this whole game but the primary objective is to create wealth so we I have an idea that's the your framework the financial management starting that's the primary objective if you take the secondary objectives organization secondary objectives could be financial and non-financial so if you take organization you will have secondary objectives where you have financial and non-financial I am just touching upon before going into the question straight away financial objectives could be various various financial objective it can be revenue related target it can be GP margin you want to maintain or you want to have a net profit of say 1 billion you can have a gearing ratio gearing ratio say 40 percent and earning per share and dividend per share so you could have various number related financial related objectives for the organization which are generally for one year period one year period you will have a organization target or the budget or it could be the objectives for one year various thing I'm just giving you some examples so these objectives are set already and then you work for that that's the organization uh, running for that year then you have non-financial objective which are nothing to do with number related it's all related to qualitative factors what are non-financial it can be quality of the product you would like to maintain certain amount of quality in the organization of the products and services so that could be your one of the non-financial and the staff welfare you want to maintain certain amount of staff welfare in the organization maybe you would like to provide a reasonable uh, perks or the remuneration and bonuses and other fringe benefits and the uh, working environment very nice working environment to employ so you could have those things and insurance for the staff members uh, medical related reimbursement 
it could be various things which are all staff related. So, the qualitative thing. So, this could be a one of the non financial objective. Then you might, might, might be environmental related. Environmental related, you might have your own objective. Uh, what kind of environment protection you would like to make, right? So, you could see the non financial objectives are all the various things, right? Relationships, relationships, relationships among the uh, staff and uh, suppliers, customers, and the overall uh, image you want to maintain. These are all non financial objectives the organization could have. It is nothing to number, but you would like to uh, maintain certain levels. So, these I am just giving you a brand image. So, you might have your own uh, what you call uh, criteria, what kind of level you would like to maintain because these are qualitative stuff not numbers. So, you would like to have certain amount of uh, uh, threshold or levels which you would like to maintain over a period of time. So, these are non financial objectives, these are financial objectives. So, these are secondary actually. The primary again I come back to the wealth maximization, wealth maximization. So, keeping that in mind, we will go to the question here. The question asks you what is the difference between or why there are two concepts called profit maximization and wealth maximization. The profit as you know we could uh, have different definition of profit maximization. You could have profit maximization and wealth maximization. So, if you take the two terminology, you could have various definition of profits, various definitions of profits. Why I say that? You can say GP, operating profit, net profit, uh, profit attributable to shareholders, profit attributable to shareholders. So, you have various profit types. So, the organization have these various types of profits and you could have objective of achieving certain amount, certain amount in essence ok, I can say a net profit target is 1 billion for the year or I would like to have a 20 percent growth in the GP. So, these are some objective you can be specify in the organization work towards it. So, these are profit objectives. So, you have various definitions. What is wealth? Wealth is about I would say the amount of resources or amount or the value of of resources the company has. So, your value of your company, value of your company is the wealth, value of your company or the resources value is the wealth of your company. So, under wealth maximization, we would like to maximize this value or the resources. It is not about one year profits, it is about your wealth that you have. Today, if I ask me, ok, how much my wealth is, I have to see, ok, what are the resources I have got? It can be property, it can be land, it can be investment in shares, it can be in debentures, government security fixed deposits. So, I take all the wealth which I could have, right, and say, and then say value of is how much. Right, that is merely purely based on net asset basis. I am just looking at. But if you really look at it, it's all your future cash flows. Present value is your wealth. Present value of the future cash flow is your wealth. So that's your wealth here. Here it's about different definition of profits. So this objective works on this, maximizing the profits. Generally, it's a short term because we always have this accounting. Uh, a mindset where the profits are calculated for a shorter period. It can be one month, three months, quarter or year, year profits. We are not even five year profits. We generally talk about maximum one year profits. That is how the financials are reported. So, the company also have a targets of achieving one year profits. Once you finish, then you go to next year profit. Okay, true that the company prepare business plans and everything, but still work for year by year, right? So, that you have a profit target of one year. So, this is the short term phenomenon. Wealth maximization is a long term thinking, long term thinking. You do not look at it for short term benefit. In the wealth maximization objective, you will see that whatever I am doing it, it should have benefit for the long run, not for the current year profits, current year purpose, current year achievements. But in the short term, in the profit maximization, it is all short term. 
So Dishyans are, Dishyans are uh, you could say short term related. Here Dishyans are uh, long term perspective, long term perspective. For example, here you might decide to reduce, reduce advertising or research and development you might decide why advertising research and development cost expenses if you reduce your profit goes up so in order to achieve higher profits you might reduce your advertising and research and development so for the current year purpose profit target purpose you say okay i have reduced my expenses i have achieved more profits so everybody's happy but in the wealth maximum objective it's not about your short term thinking it's a long term phenomenon so what you do you will not you will not reduce the advertising so reasonable or relevant relevant expenses are mean are incurred so if you take the research and development or advertising you have to incur then you will incur you don't think that i am cutting down cost it's not the cost you are talking about it's the investment you are making why you need to make continuous expenses or investments in your research and development which will benefit on a long run it's not for short period long run sustainable benefit but this uh, advertising expenses similarly you think it's a long term investment to make a brand awareness into the market or people to be aware of the products and services and to get customers for long run you keep the mindset clear all that has to be done so you will incur that you don't look at it current year profit and say current year profit is going down going down because of this you don't look at it but in the profit maximization you think okay i'll reduce this then sometime the some of the investments some of the investments you postpone some of the investment you postpone why if you realize you uh, investment will result in additional expenses like depreciation to your pnl or finance cost to your pnl you might reduce your investment for the current year but in the wealth maximum objective you will invest you will invest for long term benefit long term benefit because you realize that if the investments are made today i will benefit in the future 3 4 years later i will make the investment i don't think no no it's my my finance cost or depreciation which is going to eat into my pnl i am not going to look at it that way so this is more of a sustainable sustainable objective sustainable i want to make sure that my business is sustainable level for long run but here it's about all short term related not really concern about the long term perspective so please understand this is the two difference or two uh, objective difference profit maximization wealth maximization so you tend to take risk in the short run you will take more risk in the short run and say okay i'll make money this year somehow but in the wealth maximization you don't look take decision in that sense you will take always decision based on a long term perspective if i am taking risk true i will have benefit or not i'll consider that long run if i am taking a risk today which will benefit me in the long run and it's calculated and i'll take it not for current year profit target but here i will take the current year target and here sometime you will see certain organization dispose properties or assets to make money why to give good profit profit for the company but that asset sale you are talking about it can be a plant it can be a building it can be any asset you are telling may be giving you profit for the current year but you are going to lose the future revenue or cash flows which can be generated from the asset for uh, basically not after this year you won't get anything but in the wealth maximization you will not do that decision making because you are realize that that plant or building or any other asset which is giving cash flow for the long run you should not sell it in a two days context to make faster money better i keep it for a long term benefits or long term cash flows so that's how the thinking works on these two objective so i would say this is the primary objective as i mentioned at the beginning this is the primary objective organization even though profit objectives also they are in the organization because they work for one year uh targets and work but underlyingly they have to work on this wealth maximization 
So any other decision which are going to result in short term profits, not, not at the long run, they should not be making that decision making. It can be investment decision, it can be de financing decision, it can be dividend decision, all three decision making, all three types of decision making should work towards this, wealth maximization, not to make quick money for the one year period or shorter period. It has to be always looked at the long run, long run. Then the B part, B part, you could see the question, this number 2020, question number 1, the B part, you could see it is about a company called Serene Builders, a leading property developer in Sri Lanka. They are hoping to embark on an ambitious project, mixed development project in Colombo's exclusive property development area facing Gold Face Green. The land block identify is a two acre land next to a five star resort which belongs to wealthy businessmen. Serenity Builders has finalized the purchase price at 15 million per purchase, under 60 purchase. So we are talking about land of 320 purchase, under 60 purchase per acre. So two acres we are talking, 320 purchase at 15 million rupees, 15 million rupees. So I'm sure that is 4.8 billion rupees, 4.8 billion rupees. That's your land price. And the proposed project could have two towers, one residential tower, one commercial tower. So we are talking about one is residential tower, other one is commercial tower. So there are two towers going to be built in this uh, building or land. Proposed project will have two towers, each consisting 35 stories, 35 floors. 35 stories, both will have. Each tower has a saleable area, 350,000 square feet. So we are talking about 350,000 square feet saleable, right? Even though the, uh, some properties will have more square feet, but saleable for uh, calculation purposes as well as for the practical purposes, they have given you the square feet, saleable flow area is 350,000 square feet on both buildings. Car park could be the basement and two levels below that. So that's about the car parking. Residential building cost, residential building cost fully furnished. That means we are talking about apartment, residential building, fully furnished is estimated to be around $90 per saleable fixed uh, square feet. So residential tower, it's about $90, $90 per saleable square feet furnished. Commercial building, bare shell. Commercial building, we are not going to furnish because it depends on the customer or the person who is going to take the uh, area. He will decide how to furnish. So if we are going to sell the uh, building on a shell basis without furnishing. It is estimated to cost, cost us $60 per square feet. Sellable square feet. Sellable square feet, $60. Project could take three years, so that's completing of construction period. Construction period is three years. Construction period three years. And they have given you how the project get completed, 30 percent project cost or the construction will complete in year one, 45 percent in year two, 25 percent in year three. So this basically to give you the construction cost that you are going to incur will be taking over the three year period. So then how much you are in going to incur each year is given there in terms of percentage. Residential tower, each story have six two bedroom apartments from floor 1 to 15, priced at 15, 15 million per apartment. So we are talking about its revenue here, revenue. They are talking about each story would have six two bedroom apartments, six two bedroom apartments, 1 to 15 floors, 1 to 15 floors, 50 million per apartment. So we are talking about six apartment per floor, 15 floors, and we are talking about 50 million per floor, uh, per apartment. Apartment from floor 16 to 35 more spacious, there would only be five apartments. So we are talking five apartments, and 16 to 35 mean we are talking about another 20 floors, 
20 floors and 65 million per apartment. So, these are about your revenue of the residential tower. It is estimated that during the first year, all residential apartment would be sold and the prospective owners would pay for their apartment on annual basis as follows. So, the assumption given is 100 percentage of your apartments are sold in year 1. Year 1, you are sold. And the money you are going to get from the apartments, 25 percent sale price in year 1, 40 percent in year 2, 35 percent in third year. So, that is your cash flow going to come. Then we are talking about commercial tower. The developer, this is about the residential tower. And then your commercial tower, again the revenue, a floor is priced 250 million. You are not selling as apartments, you are selling floors. 250 million a flow. Developer is confident selling all 35 floors. So you are talking about 35 floors, all 35 floors. 250 million a flow, you are selling without furnishing. We are not talking about furnishing here, commercial clients. Year 1, you are going to get money of 10 percent, like that you have been given a time period of cash flow. And the certain builders would infuse equity of 1 billion, they are going to build 1 billion rupees of shares or the share money. And the remainder for the land acquisition would be financed through a 5 year loan at 13 percent per annum. 5 year loan, 13 percent per annum. Developer expects to fund the construction cost with pre-sales. So, please understand land cost. So, they are certain builder would infuse equity of 1 billion. So, here the funding 1 billion equity and 3.8 billion it is going to be loan. 3.8 billion going to be loan. This is for the land purchase 4.8 how they are financing this is the investment decision this is a financing decision 1.8 billion for equity 1 billion equity 3.8 billion loan 4.8 billion total 5 year loan 13 percent we will calculate numbers then the developer expects to fund the construction cost now we all remember that there is a land and a construction of the towers the construction cost is given here how much per square feet and then they have been giving the cash flows how it is going to be incurred all this, they are not going to get any money. They are going to get the money from customers or the clients who will pay their advances for the apartments or commercial towers. So, that is basically the funding way, funding strategy of this construction cost. So, there is no loan taken, there is no equity money put, construction purposes, we are taking the client's money only. So, please note that, that in finance edition is that. Then they are talking about during the year 1, assume the dollar rupee rate would remain at 185. Thereafter, year 2 onwards, Lanka rupee will depreciate 5 percent per annum. So, the exchange rate depreciation is given 5 percent per annum for the balance period. Current rupee rate 13 percent, the loan what was taken as 13 percent. Cost of equity is 18 percent, that is a shareholder return expectation. Construction sector is taxed at 20 percent. Project will be entitled to 10, 10 year tax holiday. So, therefore, no taxation for this case uh, question. Project proposal has been submitted to the bank for debt funding. Debt funding. Assume that you are the financial consultant. Actually, now always remember the question what we are asked from whose point of view. So, here the question is about a company is going to give the feasibility report or whatever to get a loan from the Prudential Bank, and we are the financial consultant to the board of Prudential Bank. One of the senior bank officers has voiced his concern or project due to the prevailing COVID 19 pandemic. So, please understand this question had been tested giving the concern of the COVID-19 because this is in December 2020 and the question uh, the COVID-19 started in 19 sorry 2020 March. So, we know we noted there were two phases in Sri Lanka we had March to May and again October November or the November December I would say. So, that second phase. So, this whole period we are talking as the COVID-19 impact. So, the question also says like one of the banker has concern given concern about this environment situation. Assume that there is no separate administration marketing cost attached to property. So, there are assumptions to make no other cost other than these costs what we are talking. Roman number 1, compute the total project cost, compute the total project cost and determine project financial feasibility in NPV values. So, it is about a simple NPV calculation. One is you have to calculate project cost, second you have to calculate the project financial feasibility in terms of NPV. We are very clearly given what is the evaluation technique we have to use, that is NPV round up to rupees millions in the calculation. So, it is all millions you have to do.
So if you go to take the uh, construction cost, we know that 4.8 billion is your land cost. So we need to calculate the construction cost so that we know the total cost of the project. Okay. So we are talking about land cost. Land cost, as I mentioned earlier, it's 4.8 billion. 4.8 billion, and the construction cost. Construction cost. We have been told that construction cost will be incurred. 350,000 square feet for the residential tower into $90, $90 and residential sorry commercial tower it will be 350,000 square feet into $60. So, this is how you are going to incur. So, your value of the dollar, of ton, dollar terms the value will be 31.5 million, 31.5 million both in dollars and uh, 21 million for the, this is for the residential tower, this is for the commercial tower. So, this is your construction cost in dollar terms and in terms of timing, please note these costs are not incurred year 1 or year 0. It is incurred over a 3 year period according to question they have said the construction cost the project would take 3 years to complete the construction 30 percent of the project construction would be completed in year 1. So, 30 percent of the cost you are going to incur in year 1. So, we will have to take the uh, total amount here the total construction cost is 52.5 million dollars 52.5 million dollars this will be incurred in three uh, period, three year period. So, we will take the year 1, year 1, year 2, year 3. So, year 1 we are talking about 30 percentage. So, 52.5 million is the total construction cost. Year 1, you will be incurring 30 percentage, 30 percent. Year 2, you are talking about 45 percent. Year 3, we are talking about 25 percent. So, basically your 100 percent construction cost will be incurred over the 3 year period. Then your amount of dollars according to your total construction cost 52.5 million for both towers. 30 percentage of that 15.75 million, 15.75 million dollars, 15.75. Then second year 23.625 million, third year it 13.125 million. So, total again it will be 52.5 million dollars. So, 52.5 million total construction cost will be incurred year 1, 2, 3 based on the physical construction we are incurring so much of cost in dollar term. Then what we need is the exchange rate, exchange rate. They have told us the exchange rate in year 1, exchange rate in year 1 will be 185. So, this will be 185, but it will depreciate 5 percentage per annum from year 2 onwards. So, 185 will depreciate by 5 percent. Please note that to buy 1 dollar we have to pay 185 in year 1 and Sri Lanka rupee is going to depreciate. Always Sri Lanka rupee if it is depreciating we have to pay more rupees to buy 1 dollar. So, if we are buying if we are paying 185 rupees to buy 1 dollar in year 1, year 2 we have to pay more rupees to buy 1 dollar. So, that means 5 percentage more than 185 which is 194.25. One ninety four point two five. The third year again five percent is more. That means you have to pay more rupees. Two hundred three point two hundred three point nine six nine six. So this is your dollar construction cost. This is the exchange rate. Then we have to calculate the rupee value. 
rupee value. So, if you multiply 15.75 by 185 rupee rate 2.9 billion, 2.9 billion and second 4.5 billion or 4.6 billion, third 2.7 billion. So, total we are going to get 10.2 billion, 10.2 billion. So, you can multiply the dollar, right, dollar construction cost by the exchange rate that will give you rupee value. So, this is your construction cost in rupee terms. Over a three year period, you are going to incur, you are estimating to incur 10.2 billion construction cost. So, your land cost is 4.8 billion, construction cost is 10.2 billion. So, we are talking about roughly 15 billion, yeah, roughly 15 billion. Your total project cost, total project cost is rupees, say 15 billion. I uh, just rounding off, right, in million. So, the, it's 15 billion. If you, you can get your uh, thousands or in million form and get the amount. So, I'm sure like you can have the look at the suggested answer also, suggested answer also. So, it's about your construction cost. So, you have land cost and construction cost. The construction cost is not incurred at one point, it is incurred over a three year period. Therefore, we have got the three year cash flows and the exchange rate and got the construction cost that gives us a total project cost. So, that is your Roman number 1, one portion of the question. Out of 13 marks, a certain amount of marks is allocated for the total project cost calculation, then the project financial feasibility, then the financial feasibility, we will come to that. So, we are talking about a investment appraisal, investment appraisal of 5 years, investment appraisal of 5 years, year 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 years. So, when you start, you are talking about land investment, land investment and we can say it is rupees millions, rupees millions, we can get the rupees millions. Year 0, as we looked at 4,800 millions, we are incurring land cost and the construction cost, construction cost, the note what we had earlier, the working we have got. So, you can look at the note 1, that what we have looked at at the construction cost breakup. It is about 2.9 billion, 2,914 million, 2,914 million, you, when you multiply in millions, you get 2,913.75, then 4,589. 4,589, these are all in rupees millions, third 2,677 millions. So, construction cost will be incurred over the 3 year period based on the physical construction completion, these are the costs you are going to incur, what you looked at earlier. So, this is your cost of investment, construction cost and the land cost. Then we talk about revenue, revenue, again you can have note number 2, Note number 2 or working 2, you can calculate your revenue. Note number 2, there what they are saying, you are talking about your revenue going to come from the apartments and the construction what you call the tower, commercial tower. So, I just have the note 2 here, just working for you. Note 2, you would see that residential tower residential tower, you have two components as you looked at earlier, one is the uh, 15 floors, four point five billion rupees which is going to be six towers, six floors, six floors and so six apartment for floor. 15 floors, as we wrote down earlier, 15 floors, 6 apartment for 1 floor, 50 million rupees, 50 million rupees. That is the way you are going to generate apartment revenue. 15 floors, 1 floor you have 6 apartment, 50 million a floor. Second, you are going to have 5 apartments for 
20 flows, 20 flows, 20 flows, which is going to be 65 million, 65 million. So, you are talking about 15 flows, 6 apartments at 15 million, balance 20 flows, 5 apartments, 65 million. So, that gives you revenue of 4.5 billion, second one 6.1 billion. So, we are talking about 11 billion rupees of money we are going to generate by apartment selling, apartment selling 11 billion. You can look at your numbers and the money is how you are going to get from the clients, you have been getting your money on annual basis over the 3 year period, over the 3 year period. So, this 11 billion is going to be received because they assume that all the apartments are sold in year 1. So, the entire sale, 11 billion sale is happened in year 1, but you do not get the 11 billion cash. For our cash flow statement, we need how the cash is going to come. So, 11 billion will be coming in year 1, year 2, year 3, over 3 year period. And they were given the percentages, year 1 25 percent, year 2 40 percent, year 3 35 percent. So, this 100 percentage of your money will come over the 3 year period like construction cost, even your apartment sale price or the value will be received in 3 year period. So, how you are going to get year 1? The 25 percentage of 11 billion, 25 percentage of 11 billion, which is how much? 2.75 billion, 2.75 billion. Second, 40 percentage, 40 percentage of 11 billion is 4.4 billion, 4.4 billion. Year 3, 35 percentage of 11 billion, which is 3.85 billion, 3.85 billion. So, this is the revenue you are going to generate from the residential apartment. So, your revenue will come year 1, 2.750 second 4400, year 3, 3850. Revenue generated from uh, residential tower, residential tower, this is the working, note 2. Then the commercial tower, both revenue you can have residential tower, then commercial tower. Commercial tower, they are talking about commercial tower, 250,000 dollars or 250 million, 250 million, 250 million into we are talking about 35 flows, 35 flows which comes to 8 billion, 8 billion 750,000, 8 billion 750,000. Now, this money this 8 billion 750,000 money you do not get in year 1. This is a 250 million per flow, 35 flows we have in commercial tower, so we get 8.75 billion. This we are not getting in year 1, we are going to get again over the period, that is 5 year period. So, you can see that year 1 we are going to get, year 1 you get 20 percent, year 2 20 percent, year 3 25, year 4 25. So, you can see year, sorry, year 1 10 percent, year 2 and 3 20 percent, year 4 25 percent, year 5 25 percent of this 8.75 billion. So, you can calculate 8.75 billion into uh, the percentage of commercial tower 875 million, year 1, year 2 1750, 1750, I raised this area. Year 2, 8,750, year 3, 1,750, year 4, 2,087.588, and year 5, again 2,087.5. This is a commercial tower, 250 million of flow, 35 flows we are selling, so we get 8.75 billion. That cash is going to come over 5 year period. So, it is not one year we are going to 8.75 billion over the 5 year period, 10 percent, 20, 20, 10, 25, again 25. So, that is how the cash flow is coming. So, these are your main cash flows. Then we are talking about a loan taken, loan taken. So, any investment decision as you know, any investment decision we know 
as a financing decision component. So, the, in the sense like it will result in financing decision. When I decide to buy a house, I need to finance that. I have to think second how I am going to finance this investment. Either housing loan or I take my own money or other sources of funding, how I am going to take. Similarly here, we took that land is purchased 4.8 billion, 1 billion the equity money, 3.8 billion is the loan money. So, equity money what you put is not taken into the cash flow statement, but it is part of your cost of capital calculation. So, debt financing, we have been given, they are given the loan uh, financing at 5 year loan, 3.8 billion at 13 percent. Since your overall cost of capital and the debt financing cost of capital is not the same, we need to include the financing cash flow. So, your loan receipt, loan receipt, you are taking 3.8 billion, then your loan repayment, you can have note 3. No 3 loan repayment over 5 year period. So, how do you calculate installment? It is the formula value of an installment, value of an installment. We are talking about a 5 year loan, 5 year loan. So, we have the amount financed, amount financed and the relevant annuity factor. This is a formula to calculate equal installment for loan. Capital and interest together equal installment. Amount financed, we are talking about 3.8 billion divided by relevant annuity factor for the 5 year period at the rate of 13 percent. So, your installment comes to your installment comes to 1080. Your installment comes to so you divide your 3.8 billion by the relevant annuity factor 1080 million is your loan repayment. So, you are getting 3.8 billion on repayment 1080 for 5 year period, 5 year period. So, this is how the cash flow is going to be. So, we have got the land investment, construction cost, revenue, commercial tower and the residential tower loan we have taken into consideration because the cost of capital 13 percent here, loan, loan cost of capital whereas your cost of equity 18. So, anyway your project cost of capital will not be equal to your loan cash flows cost of capital. So, we have to take the cash flow into the calculation. If your project cost of capital and the loan cost of capital are equal, then you can ignore the loan cash flow. But here it is different, so we have to take the loan cash flow. When you are taking a loan cash flows, I can take your net cash flows, net cash flows of project. You can take the net cash flows, you can get your net cash flows. No taxation, they are assumed already. And discounting rate, discount factor or discounting rate. So, please note you have taken the loan cash flows into calculation that project loan cash flows. Since you are taken the loan cash flows already into calculation, your cost of capital or the cash flow, net cash flow that you are arriving in this whole thing, it belongs to the shareholders. It belongs to shareholders. Your financing cash flow is considered. So, your net cash flow belongs to shareholders. Therefore, you need to discount using uh, shareholder return requirement, shareholder return requirement, not the WACC. You could have taken WACC to discount this cash flows to calculate NPV if you have taken the operation cash flow only, but you have taken the financing cash flow also. So, the cash flow whatever left over it belongs to shareholders. Since it is belonging to shareholders, you discount at the cost of equity, cost of equity is given as 18 percent, cost of equity is given as 18 percent. So, you take your net cash flow, discount at 18 percent then calculate NPV. I am not doing this multiplication of discount factor by the cash flows. As you know the cash flows are here and discount factor is uh, at the rate of 18 percent not at 13 or we have weighted every cost of capital. I think the suggested answer as WACC. Actually the cash flow belongs to the shareholder in this case because after financing cash flow since it is after the financing you have got cash flows belonging to shareholder and they have not given a separate cost of capital only this project uh, cost of equity given or they are given your cost of equity and then uh, interest rate is given for the loan year. So, therefore, we are taking the cost of equity as the relevant cost of capital to calculate the value created by this project, value created by this project. So, that is NPV of how much, NPV of how much. So, when you multiply your net cash flows by the rate of 18 percent discounting factor, please note that 18 percent discounting factor not the WACC, not the WACC, 
because the cash flows is taken already after loan cash flow. So after the uh, what you call it, uh, this financing cash flows in the calculation, net cash flow what you are arriving at is only to shareholders. So shareholders return requirement is 18 percent. So on that basis, your NPV comes to NPV comes to 1,210, 1,210 millions. So that's basically your answer. It's basically the financial feasibility. So it's a positive cash, positive NPV. So you accept the project, accept the project. So that's your Roman number one. Roman number one. They ask you compute the total project cost, determine the project financial feasibility and NPV values. So NPV point of view, it's 1.2 billion. You have a positive NPV, so project is acceptable. Project is acceptable. Then the Roman number two. So B part, Roman number two, it's about the theoretical area. Write a memo to the board of directors or Prudential Bank articulating pros and cons of the project and your recommendation to the board on whether, the, whether to offer funding for this project and the covenants required. Write a memo to the board of directors. So as you know that the questions wherever they ask you a report or memo kind of thing. Uh, please mention the presentation requirement properly, right? Even though when normally in the classes and all, we don't put that thing very seriously. But in the from exam point of view, you are given certain marks for your presentation, right? I know that it's time consuming in the sense like you are under pressure for time. So you may not take so serious about it. But then just mention uh, it's a kind of a board of director, you write a memo, so you have a to, from, subject, date, so only the four idea. Then you are writing a kind of uh, paragraph by paragraph report. So please have that format so that you get certain one or two marks for that presentation. Then I am just going to contents here. They are asking articulating pros and cons of the project, so plus and minus of the project. So what are pluses, what are minus of this project? And your recommendation to the board, so there are too many parts or three parts in this whole thing, plus and minus the project, recommendation to the board whether to offer funding for this project because you are talking about here a consultant to the bank, consultant to the bank, whether the bank should give the loan to the customer, this serin. So whether we should give the loan or not has to be recommended by the consultant. And covenants require the conditions or the maybe the uh, security whatever we are going to take. So one is the pros and cons. So firstly, we look at the plus and minus of this project. Plus, it is uh, what you call in a prime location, prime location. So the success of this project is on a normal scenario, very certain, because you are not talking about a similar project in a uh, out area. If it is out area, you may or may not have the market for that area. But we are talking about opposite golf is green, so everyone knows that it's a prime location of the country. So definitely it has a uh, more appealing, more appealing to the customers. So the prime location, so the success rate, success rate is high. And they have said the project owner is a leading property developer, leading property lead developer, leading property developer. So they are not a, a new company started, they are leading property developer, so we can uh, know their past records and see like how far, how best they have done in the past. So they are more confident among the project developer, confident on the project developer. And then third thing or fourth thing, you are not talking about uh, running a business here. You are going to build a project or build a complex and you are going to sell. So the time period we are talking is a, a limited period, limited period or maybe five years we are talking. So that is all the advantage because it's not a very long project we are going to depend on. It's a five year project. So in the, from the bank's point of view, it's not you are going to pump your money for 100 years or 20, 30 years. You are talking about five year period. So it's a time period is limited. Two, uh, the other thing is the, the equity money is all the pumped, the owner's money, equity money and the Apartment sales, pre-sales, apartment pre-sales. So that also will be there. So that's the nature of the this industry where the apartments are going to build. They take the cash from the customers on a piecemeal basis or advances. There are some uh, 
targets 30 percent, 20 percent, 40 percent like that you have to give over the period of time. So according to physical construction the money also comes in. So if you are not pumping money and building and then waiting for customer to come and buy. It is not a product like that. It is a product where while you construct you need to get your money. Okay, it has its minus also will come to that. So you have a chance of getting the shareholder money so there is a commitment from their end and then you are getting the pre-sale value and more importantly as I mentioned the prime location since it is a prime location the value of the asset value of the asset is there always value of the asset is there it is not a, a write off kind of thing where you pump money then you are lost no you have money for that it will grow it will have so there is a value in that you are not talking about uh, kind of very high risk uh, property we are talking the value will appreciate so the benefit the customer will get. So prime location, so there is a value of property, value of property, okay. So those are some of the pluses, maybe you can think if you want the tax holiday, tax holiday, so there is no tax they are going to pay on this, so tax holiday is going to be given. Okay, the minuses, minus of the project. Firstly, it is a COVID-19, COVID-19, right? COVID-19 has a negative impact in every business. So this company or this project is not an exception. As you know that uh, we are talking about this kind of apartments or this kind of properties are mostly targeted towards the foreign investments also, right? And uh, if you take a commercial property, we are talking 35 flows, 35 flows of uh, going to be used for commercial clients. Commercial clients ready to invest in this kind of property on the assumption that there will be enough customers or the tourism customer will come to the company or the products. So if they are targeting the tourism, this COVID-19 has disturbed tourism very badly. So impact on tourism, impact on tourism has a negative impact. But uh, as of the period in time we are talking, there was a negativism, negativism actually this question at that point uh, negativism is like how long this COVID-19 have an impact on the entire world. So the world has to come out of this whole issue for the tourism to be back to normal, right. Even though we started tourism recently, it is not uh, as we think, it is not so fast, right. So people will take time to settle down with the vaccination program going on. Uh, all over the country as well as the other countries, it will take few months or maybe a year to come back to the normal. So with that scenario, there is some part, portion of negativity of this project because you are going to invest money and if no one is going to buy money, buy these apartments or do not take the commercial property, the rate you are offering, there will be a question. So that is something we need to consider, it is a negative side of it. Second. The investments uh, value, investment value can increase, can increase, investment value can increase. Why? One, again COVID delays, right? You are not uh, building the work or building construction work is not happening on the as schedule. There were disturbances. So due to that, there will be delay in your construction. When you say delay in construction, the construction cost goes up. So COVID-19 delays will increase the cost, can increase. Second, the exchange rate. You are talking about per square feet construction cost, $90, $60 per square feet. So that exchange rate, we are expected 5% depreciation over a year. But as you know that this current year 2020, the exchange rate was started to depreciate faster. Then the government intervention, actually the exchange rate has got st stable at this moment, but still it you nobody knows that like, what's going to happen because we have as a country have to go through the uh, different challenges in terms of foreign currency repayments and we are uh, losing out on FDI, we are losing out on uh, tourism income. So there are a lot of things happening simultaneously. So we do not know the exchange rate how it is going to fare over the period of time. So in that case the construction cost it is really depending on the exchange rate, the exchange rate uh, variation, negative variation, it is not going to be positive variation, it could be negative variation. Negative variation will have an impact on your project cost. So this is one of the important concern you need to consider. 
cost can go up, one is delays, other one is exchange rate. Third, third, the important thing here is the demand, demand, right. We are assuming one year, within one year, everything is sold. One year, all are sold, all sold. This is a question mark, this is a question, right. Very rarely you could sell all your apartments and the commercial property in the first year. So, if you say your properties are going to be sold not in first year, it will be taking few years, not a cash flow coming. Your sale takes place over a period, then the construction cash flow comes later. So, when you delay that, delay that, this NPV can differ, NPV can reduce or maybe a minus, we do not know. So, that is another important thing where the assumption of 100 percent sale, 100 percent sale may or may not happen on the first year. So, it takes time and especially with this COVID-19 situation, it might take more time than what you thought. So, there will be an impact on your cash flow coming. So, that also have an impact. Then important thing, you are going to generate cash flows, your loan repayment, 1 billion repayment purely dependent on, dependent on uh, your apartment sale cash flows or commercial property sale. Uh, cash flows over a period of time. So, if you take the cash flows year 1 you have a 300 million minus after that you have a positive cash flow. So, you have to understand that you need to match your cash flows properly. If delay in the, your cash flow coming in then you are stuck, you are stuck even though it is a uh, very good property developer, famous property developer, uh, still when you take the project per se you may have not uh, match to your cash flows properly. So, therefore, the cash flows matching, cash flow matching concern, concern if uh, the above, above things work negatively, about things work negatively. What I am saying is, if the apartment cash flows coming late or you are not able to sell on your first year every apartment, at the same time, uh, if they, if you see the delays in payment plan, people because of the business, most of the businesses are affected at this COVID-19 situation. So, even the person who has took the apartment or person who has taken, uh, booked the commercial property may not be paying the cash flow as you thought. So, there will be delay in your cash flow. When there is a delay in the cash flow, your loan repayment may not be able to meet. You can't meet the, so that cash flow matching will be a concern another concern you have to think, maybe you have to reschedule your loan or delay your uh, longer period, that is one of the other things. So, these are the pluses and minuses of the project, Make, maybe you can add on one or two other points. If you have a situation like this, if you have a situation like this, what are you going to do? Because they ask the second part on the same question, they ask you pros and cons and recommendation. Your recommendation to board, recommendation to board basically whether to give the loan or not. The answer is yes, loan can be given, loan can be given because definitely it is a good project as I mentioned that positives when you look at it and more importantly you are not going to give a loan based on the cash flow. You are as a bank, you are going to look at the property and give the loan. So, I would say that a loan can be given by getting uh, covenants, they have asked the covenants, so basically we have to get the covenants, that is the security. We are talking about the property, mortgage and then entire cash flows routed through the bank, routed through the bank. So, you know in and out of the cash flows routed to the bank and no dividends, no dividends you can have a condition, no dividends for the till the loan is settled. These are additional thing you might say and uh, uh, what you call the property developer, property developer kind of a guarantee may or may not be, but you should be able to ask property developer guarantee for the loan repayments. 
So these are the covenants. So loan can be given with getting all these because you are very certain that the person COVID-19 negative environment change, change in a short period of time. When you take a longer period of time, the one year period is not a bigger longer period, it's a short period. So one year time, everyone knows that the, with the vaccination happening in the whole of the world, the tourism will be back in normal and the countries will be normal. So then the businesses will prosper, businesses will pro prosper. So the, this kind of property, apartments or even the other things will happen. And as you know, like Sri Lanka is promoted as a South Asia hub. So there's a benefit of those, benefit of those definitely will be the port city being coming in the Sri Lanka map. So there will be opportunities, there will be opportunities. So this project is not a going to be a failure, definitely it will be successful provided you are uh, the project owner uh, also have a commitment towards the project success and we make sure that our property as a bank, property is mortgaged properly so that we are sure of getting the money, we are secured and entire cash flow routed through us and no dividend so that the owners are committed in ensuring the project success and property uh, developers guarantee. So those are a few things you may ask the uh, company or the project developer so that we are sure of getting our money and it's not a very long term project even if you say five year project it can be delayed by another one or two years because of the present condition still we are through because it's not a very long term project so we are able to make money out of this project and project is a good project okay so that's about question number one then we move on to question number two question number two December 2020 So you could read out, Wincare Private Limited is considering investing 250 million in two securities out of three available investment opportunities. So it's about a portfolio management question. There are three opportunities of investment, A, B, C, A, B, C, and they have got 250 million. So the amount they have in hand, 250 million. So they have got three options or three opportunity of investment, A, B, C. And the ABC also they are given different uh, condition, boom, normal, recession with the probabilities. So they say if the company wishes to invest in securities A and B, 100 million allocated for A. So please note, so there are three portfolio we are talking about, three portfolio we are talking about, portfolio 1, 2, 3, one is A and B. Second, B and C. Third, A and C. So, you are given three options, three options of investing A and B, B, C and A, C. And total amount of investment, 250 million. So, if you are going to invest in A, A and B, under will be allocated for, if you take 100 million will be allocated in option 1, B, in the A and B situation, balance 150 million, C is nothing, so 250 million. Second portfolio, second portfolio, they are talking about, second portfolio B and C, they are, they say, the C will be invested 100 million, so C is 100 million. There is no A, B, balance 150 million because total amount we have is 250 million. Third, we are talking about A and C, A and C. There again C will be 200 million. C will be 200 million. Then A automatically 50 million, total 250 million. So we are talking about three portfolio. You have got opportunity of investing. A and B, then your 100 is A, B 150, B and C. B will be 150 and C will be 100 and A and C, C will be 200 million and 50 million A. So these are three uh, portfolios you have got and your amount of money in hand is 250 million. So how it is going to be allocated? So they are given three options. Then they have told us the covariation, covariance between the Covariance between the portfolio investments 
a and b covariance is given and b c given a c given. So, this is actually the relationship between relationship between respective investments what is the relationship between. So, one return goes up what will happen to the other returns. So, all here positive side of it. So, when you say a is going up b is return also goes up. The relationship is given in the in terms of number 0.3785. So, that indicates that what kind of strength of relationship it has. Generally, if you say you have more than a strong larger number that indicates the relationship is stronger. Right? It is a positive relationship, but uh, number will indicate the strength of relationship very strong or weak. If you take out a 3 portfolio AC, AC has a lowest uh, number that shows that their relationship is lower. Why, why it is important? Under portfolio management, what you learn is if you are having money to allocate among the investments, among the investments, you do not allocate the entire investment, entire money into one investment. Why? If you say I have got 10 million rupees, I go and buy one share, one company share in the stock market. Assume that company does not do well, it does not perform well or it crashes, the value of the share crashes. Entire 10 million I have invested in that company share gone, I lose the money. So, the portfolio manager say do not put all your money in one basket. This normal saying is that do not put all your money in one basket. So, you need to make sure that your money is allocated, your money is allocated among various portfolios, where various in investment opportunities. So, if you take the 10 million, I do not invest in one share, I better put it in many shares. Now, the gain portfolio management says do not put your entire 10 million into one uh, industry, one industry. Why? If I put a 10 million into 10 banks or 5 banks, 5 bank shares I put, if the banking industry fails or if they do not perform well, what happens? My entire 10 million again gone. So, the portfolio management theory says try much as possible to put into various diversified portfolios, diversified. So, 10 million is allocated say hotel industry, hospital industry, uh, manufacturing industry, various banking industry you can put the 10 million shares into various industry shares. So, that your risk is minimized, risk is minimized. So, diversify your investment, diversify your investment will reduce your risk, reduce your risk. So, firstly do not put all your money in one investment, do not put all your money into one industry. Third, try much as possible to diversify your investments. So, this is how the uh, risk is minimized in portfolio management, portfolio theories. The other important thing, the relationship between variables. When you say I am going to invest in portfolio, that means many investment, poly, collection of investment referred to be a portfolio. So, if I say A and B, it is a portfolio, right? it is not one investment, two investments. So, when I go to invest in different investment opportunities, I need to see the relationship. What is the relationship between A and B? A's returns and B's returns, what is the relationship? Are they working positively, negatively or no relationship? Why it is important? If you take two banks, I put 5 million in one bank, another, another bank 5 million. What is the relation between bank, two banks? Positive. Why? When the one bank does well, other bank also does well. There is no question about one bank doing well and other one detouring in their profits. Generally, it has a positive relationship. Why they are same industry? Because if the industry is good, both will perform well. Similarly, if the performance of the industry is not good, both will perform bad. So, we need to understand same industry companies have positively correlation. When you have positively correlation, you have a problem. Why? It looks good when the things are good. Where A is doing well, B or the does well. So, we are happy about it. But assume the other side. If the A is not doing well, B is also not doing well, then entire my investment is not performing, not giving return. So, it is a bad thing. So, what I have to do? I have to put my investment in a portfolio or allocate money for the portfolio considering the relationship. A and B should not have positively correlation. If I have it, I have a disadvantage. I try much as possible to find the investments which have negative correlation or no correlation. Negative correlation means 
when the A does well, B perform uh, badly. That means they have a negative relationship. That is a good thing. Why your risk is minimized? So you try much as possible to find the investments in the portfolio having no relationship or negative relation. Negative relation is ideal. Why? Even if the tourism sector does not do well, maybe the consumer item must be doing well. Why? Even the COVID-19, the tourism sector did not do well. But there are there enough businesses which are into consumables, products where essentials are concerned. People have to buy. People have to buy. And even the telecommunication services, they have done well. Why? Everybody has to they work from home or they are working online classes. Everybody is using the telecommunication tech, uh, services. So, telecommunication services are doing good and uh, essential goods are doing good. Maybe your uh, tourism sector is not doing well. So, if you have a portfolio where your tourism sector and the telecommunication sector, they may not have negative relationship, no relationship, still it is okay why one is doing well, one is not doing well. So, it has an opposite direction. So, you, are, you get an average return from your portfolio. This is how your portfolio has to be managed. It should be a negative correlated or no correlation investment should be in your portfolio so that you are benefited rather than having a positive relationship one. Even if you have a positive relationship, have a very lower strength, lower relationship strength having investments. As I mentioned in this question, they have given you the covariance, all are positive related but very, very low correlation. So, you need to identify the investor with the lowest one so that your risk is lower. Risk is lower. So, coming back to the uh, discussion, it has a very little information about the question information. They have given you standard deviation for the portfolio also. Advice, the question asks you, advise the company on the optimal portfolio by analyzing each possible portfolio, 11 marks. So, they want you to find what is the best portfolio you should be allocating out of this. Three portfolios are given, opportunities are given, we have decided which is better. So, firstly we need to find out what is the average expected return or expected return of each investment. Average return of each investment. Because we need to understand that they have not given you A, B, C. Ideally, you would prefer to have return of A and B, expected return of A and B or the average return of A and B. They have given you the probability. Wherever you are given probability, what we should know, what we should know, we need to calculate the expected return or expected value concept, expected value concept. So, you are being given A, B, C, three investment opportunity. Firstly, we look at the three investments separately. So, you are given the probability, three situations, probabilities are given 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, probability, it all together 1. And the returns, you are going to get 16.9, 12.5 and 8 percent. So, you need to know that there is a 50 percent chance you get 16.9 from this investment, 30 percent chance you get 12.5, 20 percent chance 8 percent. So, what is the average return? Average return. It is a mean or the expected return. Expected return, since you are given a probability, we have to calculate the average. Average is calculated by multiplying the probability by the actual return, multiply the probability by the actual return, multiply the probability by the actual return, and add it together, and you get the expected return. And you get the expected return. So, the expected return, you need to multiply 0 0.5 by 16.9. You can multiply each of these variables and add it together, your expected return comes to 13.8 percent. So, please note A investment expected return or the average return is 13.8. Why? You can have 16.9 sometimes, you can have 12.5 sometimes, 8 percent sometimes. Sometimes means 50 percent chance is there to get this return, 30 percent chance is getting this return, 20 percent chance for this return. So, on average, the mean, the expected return is 13.8. How do you get? You multiply these two, each of these probability, you multiply the actual return they are given, then when you sum it up, you get 13.8. Similarly, do it for B. Similarly, do it for B, your expected return, how much? You are given 22.5 percent, 50 percent probability, 
22.5%, 50% probability and 8% probability is 30%, 5.25 minus 20% probability. So, we need to know that these are your numbers, these are your returns that you can get, but these are with the probabilities. So, we have to calculate expected value concept, probability multiplied returns that gives you expected return. So, it investment B gives you expected return of 12.6, 12.6. C, C we are talking about similarly 20.4 multiplied by probability 50 percent and 11.7 probability is 30 percent, 3.25 20 percent chance. So, what is the average of this? Because otherwise, you have three returns, we can't give a, please note, since they are given you three return possibility, you do not add three and divide by three. You have to multiply by the probability and add it together, that is expected value concept. So, when you do that, you are getting a return of 14.36, 14.36. So, this is your mean mean or expected return of the each investment. So, out of the three investment when you look at it, C gives you the highest, A gives you second highest, B gives you third highest. This is a every return you can get, every return you can get. So, we will look at that later, A gives you 13.8 percent return that is a mean or expected return, B gives you 12.6, C gives you 14.36. So, that is your average return or the expected return of each investment opportunity. Then, we will look at before coming to the portfolio, we have to first find out the each investment return and we need to calculate the firstly we will look at the individual returns uh, of the each investment. Then we look at the standard deviation, standard deviation which is the uh, riskiness of the investment. We have to find out the standard deviation of each investment A, B, C. We will look at the standard deviation. So, we need to find out x minus x bar, x minus x bar. So, if you take the A, I will take first A. A investment x minus x bar which is basically x bar is your What is your expected return or average return or mean? Mean is the average return 13.8. So, when you take project or uh, investment A, 16.9, 16.9 is in the boom situation, you are getting actually the return. So, the x is 16.9, 16.9 minus 13.8 that gives you 3.1, 3.1. So, x minus x bar 3.1, then 12.5 that is 1.3 minus 1.3 minus then 8 percent that is 5.8 minus. So, the probability is probability is 0 0.5, 0 0.3, 0 0 0.3, 0 0.2 total 1 generally. Then what we have to do x minus x bar to the power divided multiplied by probability. So, x by x bar multiplied by probability. So, when you calculate 3.1 to the power 2 into the probability which gives you 4.81, 4.81, 0.51 and 6.73, 6.73 that gives you 12.04. 12.04. So, this how do you calculate? 
you have got x bar that is your mean, x is your uh, different scenario your return condition return. So, x minus x bar gives you this values that x minus x bar to the power 2 into the probability. So, that gets gives you these numbers. So, 12.04 then we calculate the standard deviation we can calculate the standard deviation. Standard deviation is the risk measurement please note standard deviation is risk measurement it is average risk average risk. So, standard deviation tells us the average risk average risk of your investment return can vary return can vary we realize the A return is 13.8 that 13.8 return can vary plus or minus by the standard deviation. Standard deviation reflects the, the va average variation, average variation. We always remember that okay, we want to get a return of 13.8 average return, but the 13.8 can vary plus or minus by how much? That is the average variation. Like the average return, average variation is a standard deviation, which is how much? Which is square root of square root of 12.04 3.47 square root of this value square root of this value 12.04 this is 3.47. So, please note this is your standard deviation for investment A investment A. So, investment A, A gives you average return of 13.8 having a standard deviation of 3.47, 3.47. Same thing we can do it for B and C, B and C. Same thing x minus x bar. So, the B returns are 22.5, then you minus the average return of 12.6, that gives you 9.9. .9. So, 9.9 .9, that is your x minus x bar, 9.9, .9. then it is uh, 8 percent minus that 12.6, so 4.6 percent minus, then 5.25 and the recession period 5.25 minus that minus 12.6, which we are talking about 17.8, 17.85 minus. So, this is your x minus x bar. Again, you have to calculate x minus x bar to the power 2 into probability x minus x bar to the power 2 into probability probability is the same 0 0.5 0 0.5 0 0.3 x minus x minus x bar x bar is 12.6 for b into probability that gives you 49.01 49.01 6.34 or 65 6.35 and 63.72 total of that then again standard deviation square root of the total total is 119.08 standard deviation is 10.91 10.91 so again this is a riskiness of b b project or b investment so b investment average variation average variation is 10.91 b gives you a return of 12.6 but average variation is 10.91 so, your return can vary, return can vary plus or minus by 10.91, whereas A return can vary by 3.47 plus or minus, 3.47 plus or minus. So, when you take the uh, out of the three investment opportunities, we realize C investment gives us the highest return, average return. Riskiness, I am not doing the same thing for C, but you can calculate that standard deviation standard deviation is 6.71 6.71 so this is again c c this standard deviation 6.71 so when you look at riskiness alone you can see that a has 3.47 b has 10.91 c has 6.71 out of three project or three investment opportunity a has the lowest risk B as the highest risk, but return point of view C is the highest, 
B is the lowest. So, in both sides, retention point of view B is the worst, risk wise B is the worst, highest risk. So, out of the three investment opportunity, B is the lowest risk and lowest return, or so highest risk and lowest return. A gives you the lower risk, but medium return, C gives you the higher return, but medium risk. So, these are separate investments risk return we are calculated risk and return before going to portfolio individual investment opportunities risk is calculated return is calculated so what you need to understand knowledgeably every return is this every return is this when the probabilities are given you have to calculate whether every return i can get it from each investment we have got that standard deviation gives us this just number calculation standard deviation tells us very average risk average risk of this investment. That means, your return what you are expecting will vary due to various seasons plus or minus by how much? 3.47, 10.91, 6.71. So, this is a riskiness. So, out of the riskiness if you are going to select the investment, the highest risk is this, lowest risk is this. So, as you know the basic principle risk and return has positive relationship. Higher the return, higher the risk, higher the return lower risk, lower return. But always remember, portfolio management very clearly say, highest the risk does not mean you get highest return. It is only expecting, you are expecting higher return. You are not guaranteed by anybody that you get higher return. You would see any high risk investment opportunity. Share market is generally supposed to be higher risk investment opportunity compared to bank deposit and government securities or any other investment. So, share market you are high risk investment. So, that does not mean you get high return. You may get higher return on certain scenario, but not always. You may lose your capital. That is why we always say the high return, high risk ones may or may not give you high return, may or may not give you higher return. You are not guaranteed with the higher return. But if you take the risk free investment like government security, treasury bill, treasury bond, repos, which are no risk, but you get return. They, they, so you, they are called risk free return. So, you should know your basic principles on this free investment. High risk generally supposed to or you are expecting to get higher return. Lower risk ones will give you or low returns. So, high risk ones does not mean that they will give you high return. The investor only expect higher return from the high risk ones. If I invest in share market, I expect high risk, high returns. So, I have opportunity to invest in various investment opportunity which are high risk ones. I believe I will get high return, but I may lose my capital. That is the meaning of high risk. Till you lose your money, you do not realize the word high risk. Otherwise, you are just putting high risk, high return. There is no guarantee. So, please get that point clear. So, we have got the expected return for each investment, separate investment and the expected or the standard deviation which is the average risk of the each investor opportunity we have got. So, this will be used to calculate, calculate risk of the portfolio, risk of the portfolio. So, when you want to calculate the uh, risk of the portfolio, risk of the portfolio or the standard deviation, standard deviation we are given the formula there, the examiner has given the formula there, so you can calculate the formula. So, we said portfolio, there are three portfolio, A and B, uh, B and C and A and C. A and B, we are talking about A, we are investing 100 million, B, we are investing 250 million. So, total 250 million. So, weightage, please note the weightage out of 250, 100 million is 40 percent and this is 60 percent. So, this is the weightage. B and C, C will be 100 million, C will be, maybe I have the space here, C. In this B and C portfolio, C will be 100 million and the B will be 150 million. A nothing. So, 250 million 
and my weightage 40 percent, 60 percent. Third one A and C, C I have 200 million and A 50 million, B nothing, total 250 million. So, weightage So, we can see the weightage here. A will be 50 million. So, out of 250 million, it is 20 percent weightage A, 80 percent C. So, these are your weightages. So, your weightage is 40, 60 A and B, best portfolio. Second portfolio 60 40, third one 28. So, there are three portfolio options we are given. Each portfolio weightage is given here 40 60, 60 40, here 28. So, we need to find out risk of the portfolio, risk of the portfolio. So, please apply the formula which is given in the int. So, we can calculate weighting weightage 1. So, if you take the portfolio A and B, firstly we look at A and B, A and B, weightage 1, weightage 1 will be weightage 1 40 percent, 40 percent to the power 2, 40 percent power 2 into standard deviation of the portfolio or the investment 1. So, in the A and B, A standard deviation, standard deviation we found out 347 that is 0 0.0347 to the power 2 plus I write it here down 0 0.6 weightage 2 into standard deviation of the B project or investment 10.91 0 0.2 power 2. Then you would add 2 into weightage 1 which is 0 0.4, weightage 2 0.6, 2 into 40 percent of weightage 1, weightage 2 60 percent into covariance 1 and 2, covariance 1 and 2 0 0.003785, Z3785. Then the entire thing, whatever number you get, square root that gives you risk of the portfolio, risk of the portfolio that comes to 7.9 percent. So, please note your risk of the portfolio is 7.9, 7.9. So, we have got earlier we got the risk of each investment that is standard deviation of the each investment. Here we are talking about risk of the portfolio. There are two investments in the portfolio. So, average risk is 7.9 percent, 7.9 percent. So, A and B 7.9 is the risk. So, same thing you do it for the other two portfolio other two portfolio. When you do it for other two portfolio, you get the risk of portfolio A and B, B and C, a and C. Or we will look at the portfolio A, B, B, C, A, C and you put the return average and you have the risk, the standard deviation. So, we need to calculate the average return of the portfolio, average return of the portfolio we have to calculate A and B. 
So, I might write it here the working A and B A and B if you take A we got the return of 13.8. So, you have A 13.8 percent multiplied by A we are investing 40 percent in the first portfolio you are investing 40 percent and B return is 12.6 that is 60 percent. So, 13.8 into 40 13.8 into 40 40 percentage of 13.8, 60 percentage of 12.6 that gives you average return of or the expected return of the portfolio 13.08. Similarly, B and C, B and C that portfolio B and C we are talking about uh, B will be 60 percent. So, you have 60 percent into 12.6, 60 percent into 12.6 and 40 percent age of 14.36. Please note that when you want to get the average return of the portfolio, it is like a weighted average cost of capital calculation, similar type thing. You have two investment in the portfolio, 60 percent and 40 percent. 60 percent you get from one investment return, 40 percent there you get from this return. So, you are getting a average of that. So, you multiply the 60 percent by the uh, B investment return. 40 percent age from the C investment return. So, that gives you average return of 13.3 and similarly you do it for A and C, A and C. A gives you 13.8 which is 20 percent investment or portfolio return. Pay age is 20 percent, A 13.8 you getting 14.36 80 percent. So, what is the average? That gives you A and C gives you 14.25, 14.25. Then the that is a portfolio return, average portfolio return, portfolio risk we got, portfolio risk we got 7.9, portfolio risk 7.9. 9.2, 9.2 and 6.1. So, this is basically the three portfolio average returns and risk. So, the question Roman number 1, advise a company on the optimal portfolio by analyzing each possible portfolio. So, we have got analyze all three portfolios and now we are decide what is optimal. If you look at the average return of the portfolio 13, 13, 14, risk is 7.9, 9.2, 6.1. So, we need to decide which one we are going to say as general investors perspective. You want to minimize your risk and maximize your return. You want to increase your return, minimize your risk. So, if you want to reduce your risk, 6.1 is your minimum. So, that is basically a lowest risk and return wise you want to always increase your return that is 14.25. So, coincidentally or for some reason A and C which is the portfolio gives you a lower risk highest return, highest return with real you get this situation right. So, you have the lowest risk and highest return right. So, if you take the other two here you get higher risk, but lower return. 
comparative. Here, low, comparative low risk than this B, B and C, but returns are similar to B and C. So, that is why we have to select optimal portfolio is A and C. A and C. So, A and C is the optimal portfolio as the question asks, because that gives you the lowest risk, highest return. So, in this scenario, this has happened, but generally you do not get scenario like that. So, that is basically your Roman number 1. Roman number 2, Roman number 2, if you read the Roman number 2, discuss the effects on the types of risk if Vincare Private Limited invests in a portfolio. Discuss the effects on the types of risk if Vincare Private invests in a portfolio. So, what is the question here? They are talking about riskiness riskiness so roman number 2 a part a part roman number 2 riskiness they want to talk about riskiness firstly we need to know rather than you invest in 250 million into one investment you are investing in two investments so you are investing in a portfolio by investing in a portfolio, you are actually diversifying. Investing in a portfolio means to some extent you are diversifying. Rather than depend, depending on one investment, you are dividing the investment. So, you are diversifying. The other thing, you need to see what kind of risk by, divide, diversif by uh, diversifying what kind of risk I am trying to reduce. Actually, there are two types of risk, unsystematic and systematic. Unsystematic risk is relating to specific company or industry. Unsystematic is a specific company or industry the risk. So, if you take a company as a uh, inherent weakness of strikes in the organization, or union strikes or you see that company went through a, a bad uh, a fire in the factory or building or that company is in the industry which is going through difficult time like a tourism. So, you will see that it can be a risk common to the industry or the company. If that is the case, if that is the case, that is something called unsystematic risk. We why I say that you can reduce it by diversifying your investment into various other investments, so that your risk is minimized. Systematic risk is, it is a market risk. This unsystematic is, is industry or company specific, but systematic is market risk. Market risk is something you cannot avoid. If you decide I would like to invest in share market, you are accepted I want to invest in a risky environment. That is common in all the shares in the market. Maybe one share has a more risk, other share has a lower risk, but they have risk. If you do not want any risk, do not put your money in government securities. If you want return and you want to increase your return, you have to go to the risky investment. Not that I risk once, but at least some risk you would accept. So, market risk is common in the systematic risk in market risk, which is common in the markets. Every company in the stock market will have that risk. You cannot avoid that. You have to accept that risk, which can be panicking, it can be a, a various factor which is affecting your macro picture, have impact on your system, systematic risk. Unsystematic risk can be diversified away by getting into more investments. So, if you have put all your money into uh, all the stocks in the stock market, you are diversified very well. So, your risk is very, very low in terms of systematic, unsystematic. So, that is something here we will talk about Wincare Limited diversify their stocks by getting into two investments. So, they have reduced their risk. Then the third thing, the relationship, relationship between variable. As I mentioned to you, covariance reflect the relationship between the two variables or two investment opportunity. 
the lower strength, lower strength you see in A and C. So we gave, we got the lowest risk there, lowest risk there, A and C. Whether we get higher return or not is separate thing. Lowest risk we got in A and C because they gave the lowest covariance, lowest covariance. So we need to understand that A and C lowest risk which is identified by the low strength of covariance or relationship. Low strength of relationship between A and C, which was denoted by the number given by covariance 0 0.2329, 0 0.2329. So actually what we have to understand here, riskiness is reduced by selecting optimal portfolio because it gives you the lowest risk. So you have diversified by doing that you have reduced your unsystematic risk. But systematic risk you cannot avoid that is common in the market environment. So that is basically the Roman number 2. Then moving to B part, B part of the question. Actually, the Roman number 2 part, certain things I discussed while we were doing the uh, number related relation between standard deviation and the riskiness and the return changes, all that we discussed. So, uh, maybe we do not have to repeat it. B part, An investor is evaluating the following financial information related to Lima PLC in order to buy the shares of the company. So they are talking about an investor's point. He is evaluating a company called Lima PLC, listed company, to buy the shares of the company. Earning per share, dividend payout ratio given. So when you are given earning per share and dividend payout, we can calculate dividend per share, dividend per share per year. For the year 2020, that is the latest year, company recorded net profit after tax of 138 million, proposed a dividend payout of 50 percent. So, 2020, 138 million profit, dividend payout 50 percent. Number of shares 50 million. Due to the adverse effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on the economy or the country, the expected dividend growth of the company for the next two years would decline by 1 percent. When compared to current dividend growth of the company, thereafter expected dividend growth rate would be 4 percent. So they are saying that current dividend growth rate of the company will go down by 1 percentage for next two years. After that, the dividend growth will be settled down at 4 percent. Investors expect additional risk premium of 2 percent compared to 13 percent return given by the other company in the same industry due to recent change in the board of directors of Lima PLC. So this investor would require a return expectation is return expectation 15 percent. Similar company in the market, the investor won only 13 percent. For this company, return investor, investor wants 15 percent. So, 15 percent is return requirement, market price 18.75. Advice whether the investor should invest in the shares of Lima PLC. Advice whether the investor should invest in the shares of Lima PLC. So, very, very simple question. What they are asked is to Calculate the value of the share based on dividend related model and see whether the market price 18.75 is overvalued or undervalued. So you have to calculate the inherent intrinsic intrinsic value of the share based on dividend man model and compare with your market price. So we are given earning per share, dividend payout. Then we can calculate dividend per share, 2000 year, 2016, 17, 18, 19, 20, 1.80, all rupees, 2.10, 2.45, 2.50 and 2020. We are talking about 138 million shares, sorry, 130 million profit, 50 million shares. So, 
138 million rupees profits divided by 50 million shares gives you 2.76 earning per share. Dividend by a ratio 60%, 55%, 50%, last year 50%. So, we know that dividend payout means from your profits, what is the amount of dividend you are paying to shareholder. If I say 100 million profits, if I pay 50 million dividend out of the 100 million profit, my dividend payout ratio is 50%. So, they are given you 50% or whatever the dividend payout ratio and they are given you earning per share. So, we know that from the earning per share, I have dividend payout so much. So, dividend per share is when I multiply 60% by 1.8, I get the dividend per share. So, which comes to 1.08. 1.16, that is earning per share multiplied by dividend payout ratio gives you dividend per share. So, we know the 5 year dividends over the last 5 years okay, including last current year. So, we would like to value the share. So, what is the model we are going to use? We know under dividend models, there are three sub models. One is dividend valuation model, which is we assume that dividend is going to be paid on a constant amount every year. Equal amount of dividend every year if you are going to pay, you use constant dividend valuation model. If you are seeing that dividends are going to have a growth, constant dividend growth, equal growth rate, then we are going to use the dividend growth model. If you see that dividends have two phases or three phases growth, first couple of years one growth rate after another growth rate. Then we use the two stage or three stage model. So, this question talks about next two years due to COVID pandemic, the two year the growth rate will be 1 percent lower than the average growth in the past. So, we have to find out the average growth or the current growth rate firstly, then we reduce by 1 percent and find out next two year dividend. After that dividend will grow at the constant rate of 4 percent. So, based on these, we have to calculate the value of the share. So, shall we look at the average dividend growth rate? Average dividend growth rate of the past. Average dividend growth rate, how do you calculate? You know 1.38 is your latest dividend and 1.08 is starting point, 1 plus growth rate over the 4 years. 1, 2, 3, 4. So, your average growth rate how much? 1.08 is your starting year in the 5, 5, 5 years. Starting point with a growth rate 1 plus g to the power 4 gives you the latest. So, average compounding growth rate, average compounding growth rate is 6.3 percent. Average compounding growth rate 6.3. So, that means 1.08 to 1.38 we know there is a growth, but the average growth compounding basis. This is the formula to calculate 1.08 starting point 1 plus g to the power 4. 4 is the number of years in between 4 years equals 1.38 6.3 percent growth average growth of the past average growth of the past. So, we have got the dividend growth rate for the last 4 years. Six point three percent is the average growth. So we have to calculate the market value. So we know that year one, year two, then year through year three to infinite period, year three to infinite period. So dividend per share, year one two. So average growth rate, average growth rate six point three percent per annum. They say it will reduce by one percent. So, that means you are talking about 5.3 percent for next 1 and 2 years. So, your average growth rate will come down by 1 percent that become 5.3. So, year 1 and year 2. So, year 1 your dividend will be dividend per share will be your 1.38 was the last year dividend 2020. 1.38 1 plus 0 5 3, 1.3 is 2020 dividend that will grow at 5.3 not 6.3 average growth rate 1 percent lower 5.3, 1.38 5.3, 1 
1 plus g that gives you 1.45 1.45 second one similarly 1.45 with a 5.3 percent next growth 1.53 1.53 so that is your year 1 and year 2 dividend cash flow dividend per share or dividend cash flow then year 3 to infinite period that is 1.53 we have to calculate terminal value 1.53 1 plus 0 0.04 there is a growth of 4 percent after that. Divided by R minus G. R is your return requirement, return requirement which is 15 percent minus So, you will have your discounting factor or annuity factor, then your present value, present value. Year 1, your discounting factor at the rate of 15 percent, we have, they have been uh, talking about 13 percent industry company return expectation, but your company investors want 2 percent more. So, your 15 percent return requirement. So, your discounting rate is 15 percent. At 15 percent, your discounting factor is 0 0.869. Year 2, point 756. So, your cash flow multiply there 1.26 percent value and 1.16 percent value. Here, this year cash flow will be 1.53, will be growing at 1 plus 0 0.4. This is your cash flow. What is your present value? This is your year 3 to infinite period perpetual cash flow, perpetual cash flow. So, this cash flow 1.53, 1.04 divided by 15 minus 11. So, that is your future, entire future cash flows present value you will get. So, that comes to 14.47, 14.47. Again, this is a present value as of end of 2 years because your cash flow start from year 3 onwards, 3 mean end of 3 end of 3 onwards, when you get your present value using the dividend growth model for the second phase, your present value will be 14.47, but this is not at year 0 present value, this is at the end of year 2. If the cash flow start from year 3 end, one year before that is year 2 end, you are getting this cash flow. So, this is your value, present value at the end of, end of year 2. But these two present values are year 0 year 0. So, this is at the end of year 2. How do I bring it to year 0? Again multiply at 0.756 that is the end of 2 years discounting factor 14.47 into 0.756 that gives you 10.94 that is again year 0. I will raise this area. So, what we have done? We are getting year 1 cash flow 1.45, present value of that 1.26. Year 2, 1.53, again 5.3 percent growth, what we looked at, 1.16, year 2, cash flows, present value. Year 3 to infinite period, entire future cash flows, present value we got here 14.47 using dividend growth model, because a constant growth rate for entire future, 4 percent. So, return to come 15 percent, so 11. This is 15 percentage your return requirement. This is growth rate. Actually, dividend growth model, as you know, is your equals to DO 1 plus G R minus G. R stands for return requirement, G stands for dividend growth rate. On that basis, only we have used this formula 1.53 is year 2 cash flow, DO. 1 plus G is a 4 percent. Return requirement 15 percent growth rate 4 percent. So, you get 14.47. So, uh, average sorry present value at the end of year 2 is 14.47. Since it is end of 2 years, you have to bring it to year 0, we again rediscounted 0.756, then we got 10.94. So, what is the total present values? 13.36, 13.36. This is the value of the share, value of the share x div. 
that means current year dividend which is proposed is not included in this calculation. So, x div is 13.36. So, if you want to calculate cum div, your latest dividend is 1.38, 2020 dividend not paid, 2000 dividend not paid, 1.38 that means 14.74. 14.74, this is the value of the share, value of the share cum div, value of share cum div. So, please note that they wanted you to calculate, not calculate actually they were asking you whether to invest or not invest. From investor point of view as a return requirement of 15 percent, the market value of the share based on dividend cash flows 14.74. Whereas, the market price, market price 18.75, 18.75. So, the advice whether you are advising them to buy the shares at 18.75 or not buy the 18.75. Based on the future dividend cash flow, the share is worth only 14.74, whereas the market, the share price is at 18.75. So, based on dividend cash flow method of valuation, share is worth only 14.75, whereas the market the share is trading at 18.75, we should not recommend to buy the shares. We should not recommend to buy the shares. But as you know, as you know, dividend cash flow method of valuation is considering only dividend cash flows. It is not the total earnings, it is not total future cash flows. So, total earning, total future cash flow not considered, only dividend cash flows considered. Based on dividend cash flow, it is only 14.74. But when you look at the total earnings, total future cash flow or free cash flow, the share can be more than this value, more than this value, definitely more than this value. So, if this is more than that, then your 18.75 may be lower than your market uh, intrinsic value. So, our answer should be based on dividend growth model or dividend two stage model, the share price is 14 point something, it is not advisable to buy at 18.75 answer. But make a note, since dividend cash flow method is based on purely dividend cash flow, not based on free cash flow, not based on total earnings of the company, the share could be more valuable when we use those methods. If that method gives you 25 rupees share price, 18.75 is recommended for buying. We do not know that information, we do not know how to calculate. At this moment, information not available. Therefore, our advice is to based on dividend growth, do not buy. Okay. So, that is about your question number 2.